Doobl is a free and open source web browser that was created to improve privacy and has been reviewed positively by PC World and the UK's Guardian newspaper. Installed in Doobl cannot be any easier on FreeBSD. You can either use ports or PKG, like this. No need for dodgy PPAs or downloading from untrusted places. This is FreeBSD, and we do things properly here. If you make a search for the name of the browser we're looking at today, there's a good chance you will find some strange, non-related items. Ignore those, and instead click on the Doable Web Browser link. Looking at the information supplied by Wikipedia, you can see that Doable is cross-platform. What's great is that it actually lists FreeBSD first. Also that it is Qt based, which is nice. More crucially, and unusually, it is BSD3 licensed, making it an attractive proposition for people wanting to perhaps lessen their use or dependence on GPL code. So, looking at the features, Doobl includes a simple bookmarking system. As Doobl is geared towards privacy, there is a good cookie management, a Tor browser add-on support, security passphrase, and much more. Go to the main site for a more in-depth description of the features available. Anyway, back to the search engine links. Clicking on the first link presented on Google will take you to an old version of the Doobl website. And if you do, then you may get the impression of a project that has been abandoned. But on this old page, you will find a link to the new page and to details of the latest release. On the new site, you will see a little bit of information on when the first version was released of the old version and the initial release of the next generation version. Scrolling down, you will see the release versions with the latest at the time of this video being 2021.08.05 and the FreeBSD version is one behind at 2021.07.05. Looking at the browser interface, you'll see that under the file tab, there is new private window, new tab, new window, open URL, close tab, save, print, print preview, and exit doable. Next up is the edit menu, where you will find some of the privacy options in this browser. You can clear items that may have been saved. You can clear visited links. You have a search tool a settings option, and you can vacuum the database if you want, just to make sure you've cleaned up after yourself. On selecting clear items, you can clean up everything from accepted or blocked domains to visited links with almost everything else in between. It's very handy indeed. Taking a closer look at the settings option, you are presented with a default config page where the most likely changed options lie, namely the web options but you can select specific areas of configuration to tweak and alter, and the first we will take a look at is the cache. You can alter the cache amount and the type, and this is a good and bad thing. It's entirely based in RAM, so that when the machine shuts down or reboots, the RAM is cleared, and the cache cannot be accessed. But you have to make sure you have enough RAM before altering this setting. But you can clear it if you notice any funny goings on. And the alternative to using RAM, well, that's having no cache at all. Next is the display configuration where we can change the start page, the theme, the language, and other visual items related to the browser. The history option is small, allowing you to specify how long or how many days worth of browsing history do you want to remember. The visited links checkbox allows the local visited links file to be written to, or not, as the case may be. Next is the big one, and I suppose that's to be expected in a privacy-focused browser, and that's the options for privacy itself. You get the option to change cookie policy, to save, not to save, or to save only those persistent cookies you may want. Then we have the credentials option, where if you want, you can encrypt all the information your browser picks up on your journey on the web. It's pretty handy if you want that sort of thing, and it looks like it uses strongish encryption. The alternative is to store this information as plain text. Again, it's good to have it if you need this. Just underneath there is a do not track and a private mode, as well as the option to use a proxy if desired. And lastly, you have the option to use UTC time zone if you wish to. Next is the web options that we've already had a brief look at, but we'll have a closer look now. 
The first option is animated scrolling, and to be honest, I'm not 100% sure what this is. The next few checkboxes are self-explanatory, with DNS prefetch perhaps being an odd choice, but it can speed things up if enabled. The feature permissions option is to allow, or not to, pop-ups, notifications, etc. from your favourite websites. Following this are the usual options in a browser, and that's to change fonts, sizes. It's pretty standard in modern browsers. Then it's JavaScript access, a small checkbox for a large decision, I think. It's enabled by default. Most sites probably won't work or look right without it. But if it's an issue, untick it if you want. Access clipboard and block pop-ups are next, followed by whether to allow local storage, the user agent you wish to use, and whether to use web plugins, like WebGL, etc. And finally, another small option, the Windows option. Uh, no, it's not that Windows, but your browser Windows setting. Save the Windows geometry the next time you use your browser, and whether to center things for better clarity. And that's it for the options you can configure. Not bad. The next tab along is the Tools menu, where we can see the accepted or blocked domains, certificate exceptions, charts. I don't know what that does, but uh, if anyone knows, can you please drop a, uh, a message in the comment section down below? I think it's to do with the sites you've already visited, but I'm not sure. You can view, delete, or allow, deny cookies, view your downloads, add, delete, and view your favorites, or bookmarks, if you prefer. But it isn't as good as the system used in Firefox, and I, I miss the easy folder where you can arrange things uh, there. Next is a floating digital clock. Now, at first I thought that this was a little silly, but using it, I can see its merits. So you can keep track of time if you are having a heavy browsing session. And if your desktop clock is uh, covered, you could easily lose track of time, which is nice. I remember the Amiga having something like this with its early browsers back in the old days. Next, you can view your browsing history. You can use a custom style sheet and you can change or use a specified default search engine. Then we have some view options. Uh, there's only two here, uh, and that's to show a full screen and show a status bar. Still, it's handy to have the choice. The history tab allows you to view what was the last few sites visited, as well as the option to clear the said history. And then finally, there is the help menu, which helpfully gives you the help you need in the form of documentation and release notes. Isn't that helpful? Now, over to the other side of the browser, jumping over the obligatory URL area, we have the accepted or blocked domain exception button. What a mouthful. Then a download viewer to see what and how far a download is going. Then there is the bookmark or favorites button. Then one of those burger menu things, which uh, I don't, I'm not keen on, where you can find any of the options we've already uh, seen, plus a few more laid out in a nice icon view for quick and easy access. And that's it. The Double BSD3 license browser. It's lightweight and fast, it's great for privacy, and it's BSD3 licensed. But it could do with some polish. Is it a browser you will consider, or could consider? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section if you think that this is a possible winner or a stinky loser. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you next time.